Um, I have just, uh, I think, two things that I want to say before I introduce our speakers. Uh, one is that um, this has been a journey for me, uh, putting this discussion together. Uh, there are so many wonderful stories. So I'm hoping that it's not the last. Um, and that you as an audience will have other opportunities over this next year to hear stories, not only from the African American community, but from other communities, and I know you will. But particularly in the African American community, this African American community here is unique in many ways in that it is very old. Um, you know, there were, of course there were enslaved Africans here, but at the end of the Civil War, there were people who bought property here and you have a community that really started here as an established community in 1865. It's a very old community. And of course, when you have an old community, you have lots of stories, lots of stories. Um, and um, the other thing that I wanted to say is that in the process of doing, getting, talking these lovely people into taking this risk and coming to talk today, um, I did find some people with great stories who weren't able to come. And um, I'm going to read you just one of those, just a very short um, excerpt. <clears throat> this is Ruth Burton's story, Ruth Wood Burton, and it's, it's, I did an interview and it's copied in the back. But since this is also one year from the centennial, I think it is, of Columbia Pike, I thought you would be interested because she grew up on Columbia Pike. And this is what she says about Queen City and Columbia Pike. She was born, uh, her name is Ruth Wood Burton. She was born in Arlington, Virginia at 1011 Columbia Pike on 9-8-1918. It was her grandmother's house and she was born in the house. The backyard was large and flat. Columbia Pike was dirt and there were no sidewalks. Sidewalks were put in when they paved the road. There were houses on both sides of us and across the street. We were near South 9th Street. My godmother lived next door. The Safeway that's now on Columbia Pike was a grocery store named The Sanitary. There were two stores run by Jewish folks where we could shop. I remember big pickles from a barrel with a pe peppermint stick that we stuck into the pickle. And that, Mr. Hyman sold those. Mr. Siegel was the other store. He sold crackers. Both sold canned goods. My grandma had a lunchroom up the pike. She sold sandwiches, pickled tripe and sliced tripe. I think I remember the tripe because that's what I liked. She probably made other things, too. Holmes Bakery had a delivery truck and made a good pound cake. The first bus I rode was called the Arnold Bus Line. It was a line from Queen City to Roslyn. On the trolley and the bus, the driver always said to us, step to the rear. The streetcar ran on a track parallel to Columbia Pike some distance away. And I invite you to read the other material from her story um, because it's a very interesting story. Now, the people whom we have with us today, and I'm very, very, I've told them so many times, thanks for their coming, and I'll say it again. Thank you for all of your efforts in coming. Uh, I'm going to introduce, just a, tell you a sentence or two about each of them, and then we're, they're basically going to speak in the order that they're sitting here. Maddie Walker is an old friend, actually. Maddie Walker is a colleague. Um, she was one of my instructors in how to be the president of the Arlington Education <laughs> Association because Maddie was, uh, uh, she was a teacher in the system and then a counselor. Um, and she's gonna tell you a little bit about how that came to be, but she was also then the president of the Arlington Education Association and the first African-American president of the Arlington Education Association and always a great help to me. Uh, Kenny James was born in DC, but he was raised in Arlington, right? And um, he is currently the regional food service manager for the DC public schools. And he will tell you he has family connections as we speak to the Arlington public schools because he has children in them. And Patty Monroe Meek was raised in Arlington, although as she told me, her actual birthplace was Cheverly. That's where the doctor was. Um, <laughs> she is the youngest child of Eleanor Ames Monroe. And she's gonna talk a little bit about her mom and her dad. And um, so Maddie's gonna start. Good evening. If Ichabod Crane had fallen asleep when I was a child growing up and he awakened tonight, he would be so disoriented. <laughs> he wouldn't recognize anything. 
Arlington was no longer a farming community when I was growing up, but it has it had e evolved. It was a bedroom community, literally a bedroom community, nothing there but houses. Then, of course, it became suburbia, and now to avoid that word city, you call yourself an urban village, whatever that <laughs> is. But my time began when my father migrated to Arlington uh, from Mecklenburg County, Virginia, where he lived. He was a married teenager living on his family's farm. And it was the practice at that time for people to come by and uh, the young men would take jobs away from home to gain, uh, to make a little bit of money. They, my family, his family raised uh, tobacco and cotton. So he had never done it before. But he, because he had not come of age, but now he was. So one day, some recruiters came by and asked for someone to come to Arlington and to take a construction job. Uh, to the job was to build a school for the colored children, mm -hmm. and it turned out to be on land that was donated by an African American family that you were just mentioning about the Hoffmans and the Bostons. They gave their land to build a six-room school, Hoffman, Boston. So my father came, and he had wonderful stories to tell about three other guys came, and they all lived in one room and ate banana bologna sandwiches because they didn't know how to cook. <laughs> but anyway, he worked to build that school, and he was hired as a common, what the Labor Department calls a common laborer. He was a farmer. He was not a uh, skilled laborer. Uh, he worked with the dirt. But as the job went on, he heard about the Washington school system that had a dual system. They had school in the day and in the night. And he and my mother had not had the opportunity to go much further than the eighth grade because there were no facilities, no schools for them in Mecklenburg County. So when someone came by from the Helms Concrete and Pipe Company and offered him to come to work with him, he thought, mm, yeah, we'll see. And so he brought my mother and his grandmother, whose house he had moved into in Mecklenburg because he had a bride and he needed more space. And they came to Arlington, she came to Arlington, and my father, after digging all day, enrolled in Armstrong Technical School and my mother, Mary Washington Domestic School. Mary Washington, it doesn't exist anymore. Armstrong does. Uh, oh yes, Armstrong yes. does. Mary Washington right. is defunct. So they got themselves through high school. Time passed and he went to work for the Helms Concrete Pipe Company. He didn't know he'd be there 40 years, but he did. <laughs> And uh, he was making more money. So eventually he gave his, he arranged for his farm, his portion of the farm to be taken over by tenant farmers and so forth. And then the children began to come. We fast forward a little bit. And when I was four years old, I was one of four children. When I was four years old, uh, my one September day, my birthday is in September, my mother t took me put on a dress instead of the play clothes that I wore to St. John Baptist Church Nursery School. She put on her hat and gloves and her uh, put a book in her, in her purse. And we went up to Hoffman Boston School. And she told the principal she wanted to enroll me in first grade. Well, neither the principal nor my mother knew anything about readiness or socialization, <laughs> that sort of thing. And I was enrolled in Hoffman Boston School. They regretted it, but I settled down <laughs> eventually. <laughs> then fast forward some more. I have graduated from college, and I've uh, come. I'm in Arlington, asking, uh, interviewing with Mr. Charlie Wilson, the person in the personnel department for a job. So, uh, in in the course of the interview, Mr. Wilson said, "Aren't you?" a little young to be teaching, and I thought to myself, if your mother had put you in school as a toddler, you'd be young too. <laughs> but I didn't say that. What I said was, 
I'm not too, I wasn't too young to certify. And the minute I said it, I wondered if that was flipped. But he did hire me. He called me back in, and he gave me a 10-month contract at the magnificent sum of $2,900 a year. <laughs> and it was to be paid over a 12-month period of time, and I was assigned to teach at Hoffman Boston School. Well, I was the euphoric. I was rich. <laughs> and But... When school opened and I went into class, I reflected. I thought, the first public school that I ever attended and the first school in which I taught was a school that my father built. And I thought that was very cool. And I still think it is. It is very cool. It's all right. My father, I went to Hoffman Boston School through the elementary grades until I was in the fifth grade. And they wanted me to go to Dunbar High School because Dunbar High School was an academic school and had a re wonderful reputation. So when I was in the fifth grade, we moved to, uh, I went to Stephen School in Georgetown because that was sort of the feeder school to go into Dunbar. And we, the, if I'd like to give you a picture of what Arlington was like about, you were identified by your families. And they were families, we were, uh, had migrated here. My father was one of the younger ones as far as residency was concerned because people were there who, in Arlington, who had been here back to the time of Freedman's Village. Yep and it was a very stable community, and it was a very cohesive community. It was very cohesive, to, and the people were very close-knit. And at that time, people took care of each other's children. Later on, um, someone wrote a book, I think it was our Secretary of State, It Takes a Village. Mm -hmm. Well, that's exactly the way it was. And we were, I use the word cocooned. We were cocooned because Arlington was a very segregated place. And segregation is ugly. I don't care where it takes place. It was a very rigid. But the, the, save, the thing that saved us was that there was nothing here to segregate. Arlington was a backwater. Yeah. <laughs> there was nothing here. There were no restaurants, there were no movies, and we lived right next door to Washington. We didn't even call it Washington, we said in town. And we would ride our bicycles down and go to the museums and so forth and just do all kinds of things. And then too, it, they had, a part of it was uh, the style of child rearing. Our parents took great care to keep us insulated from things. They didn't talk about things when children were around, and they steered you. I can remember if my mother was going to have company in the parlor, the kids left. <laughs> they just didn't tell us and talk about things. Now, some of the families that I remember that looked after us were the Burtons, the Jameses, that's your family, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I like to tell a little joke about uh, Roberta Flack, there was a Mrs. Burke, it was what the, a family of Burks, and it was a ritual that when you got to be a certain size, you went to Mrs. Burke for piano lessons. So you, you did, you got washed up, and, and you had to be very quiet on the porch and waiting your turn. And um, Roberta Flack is a Burke. Uh, she gained fame by raindrops keep falling on your head and burp back around. And I, I can't play a note, but I love to tell people that I had the same teacher yeah. as, <laughs> <laughs> as, as Roberta Brack. Uh, we had a lot of fun doing things, and we were just not aware. I think we were younger in maturation and development than our chronological years, because mm -hmm. we endured some things that we didn't even really know. For instance, one of the best things that I liked was going with my father mm -hmm. 
at, to the industrial bank on U Street. Oh, it was so fun. We'd go over and afterwards we'd have lunch and uh, had an ice cream cone and I'd look in the, we would visit the Skirlock photographers, very famous black photographers who had a window to their studio on U Street. Well, I did not know, <laughs> it was a long time before I knew that the reason my father was going to the industrial bank was no black person to t have any banking privileges. Yeah. I didn't know that. But uh, we just didn't know certain things and that kind of cocooned us. Also, we used to go to an amusement park which was down where the National Airport and Gravelly Point in that mm -hmm. area. And we had lots of fun there. And I didn't know until I saw in the paper that some children, some girls from uh, Howard University were protesting the discrimination at Glen Echo. Mm -hmm. And that's how I knew that why we had suburban park that we were confined to going there. Um, this is a beautiful library. But the library was one of the things that you had here. You had a library, there were two campers, mm -hmm. two hooked together, and you dare not go there. And I usually tell people that I'm a native Arlingtonian. I am not. <laughs> I correct myself when I think about it. And uh, because I was not born in Arlington, and one of the reasons that I was not born in Arlington is because Arlington Hospital did not allow black people to be served there. So my mother, the only people my age, and I'm older than they are, <laughs> <laughs> the only people my age who were born in Arlington may have been born at home or they were born on the Virginia side of 14th Street trying to make it to Friedman's Hospital. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, my Dr. Bruner, and Dr. Johnson were do doctors here. And uh, they took care, of my, Dr. Bruner took care of my mother. And then we went, she went to Mecklenburg. Now Mecklenburg was segregated too, but there were three doctors there who had a clinic from Meharry. Meharry is the institution that has uh, trained more black doctors than any other in there. And uh, he had residents from Meharry and they had a clinic set up and she was safely delivered there and then she would come back when she could, uh, uh, would travel. And so I was conceived in Arlington. <laughs> 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 and I did that. When I was about, at, completed the fifth grade, um, I, my parents built their own home, which is on First Road, mm -hmm. around the corner from Dr. Drew. Ah, yes. A and so forth. That's where, that's where we, we live there. And there's one of the things I think is one of the most insulting things that I could possibly think of is the business about riding the bus, the back of the bus. However, I never rode in the back of the bus. Mm -hmm. And that's a story in itself. One time we were having dinner at my mother's house. That this was back in the days when you had family dinners. And uh, somebody mentioned something about Rosa Parks. I don't know if it was her birthday or what, and my mother pointed across the table and said, that's our Rosa Parks. And she told a story about how uh, when I was three going on four, I went with a lady on the bus to go into Washington. The, during those days, women used to go and spend the day with each other and you brought your child. This lady didn't have a child, she borrowed me. She wished she hadn't. And so when you came back from Washington in Roslyn, the streetcar stopped there. So when you got out of the streetcar on this side, you were in Virginia. Now many years, I think in 1919, I don't go back that far, but the buses and the streetcars in Washington uh, were integrated, you could yes. sit anywhere. But when you got to Roslyn and you turned, this is where you did that. Well, she got on the bus with me and sat in, a, in an appropriate her place. But then 
as the bus filled out that was awaiting she, she was told to move. Well, I don't know whether I was looking at dust balls on the window. Who knows what a toddler does? But I wouldn't uh, well, let no. her get up. And such as she had to get off that bus, walk all the way up to Tatfield. It's called Penrose now, but that the stop was Tatfield. And when she got home, she was just about to collapse. And so I, knowing my father, he decided I wouldn't always be three years old, and he wasn't going to take a chance on having us ride. So we didn't ride the bus. And uh, although I went to high school in, at Dun in Dunbar, and I went to elementary school to the sixth grade at mm -hmm. Stevens, we never rode the bus. He drove you? He drove us. My he father did. was a... Uh, my father was a kind of a mechanical genius. He's, uh, he, the first car he bought, he took it apart to see how it worked and taught himself to drive it. Mm -hmm. And I married a man who was a, a graduate engineer from uh, Rutgers, and he said that my father knew things instinctively that he had to look up in the books. <laughs> so my father always had uh, cars more than one around. He loved cars. I had to get rid of some cars when he died. <laughs> but that was his hobby. Mm -hmm. But he always made sure there was a car for my mother to drive us back to school. Mm -hmm. I think my time is up. It is. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Jenny? Wow. That was a wonderful story. Wonderful story. <coughs> Good evening, everyone. My name is Kenny James, and uh, I'm very happy and delighted to be here today to share my experience of growing up in Arlington. Um, first of all, there's so much that I could tell you, but because we have time constraints, I've tried to uh, limit my words to the following. Uh, the first one is talking about my family, which is going to take up the majority. Uh, my school experience here in Arlington um, sports and recreational experience, which was a big part of my life in Arlington, and then community pride. First, I'm going to start off to tell you a little bit about my, my grandparents. Uh, my grandparents were Eugene and Mamie James, and they came to Arlington from Culpeper, Virginia, around the early 1900s. Like many other blacks, they were looking for a better way of life, uh, and so they, so they migrated north. Um, it was said that my grandfather and his two brothers left Virginia, left the country, heading north. <clears throat> my, my great uncle George didn't stop until he got to New York, New York City <laughs> in, the, in that area. <clears throat> my great uncle Edward settled in Rhode Island, so he continued to go, up, go north. My grandfather got to Philadelphia, and he pumped his brakes and stopped and didn't go any further. <clears throat> um, it was said that he forgot something back down Culpeper. That turned out to be my grandmother, so it was a good thing <laughs> that he went back, <coughs> went back for her. So they came back up, and they relocated in, uh, in Arlington, Virginia. Uh, and this is how the James family settled and came to uh, Arlington, Virginia. <coughs> I also want to point out that my grandfather <coughs> uh, worked at the White House for many years. He organized a, uh, a black butler and waiter union and was one of the first black maitre d's at the White, White House. So that was some unique things about my grandfather growing up that we always, I always heard stories about. Now, my, my grandparents raised six kids in Arlington, and I'll tell you briefly about, about them. Uh, my, my aunt, Elizabeth Hazel, who many of you might know if you're educators here in Arlington, she was a teacher, administrator, and uh, you can almost write a book about her and she worked in D.C. public schools in Arlington, County, in Arlington County Public Schools for years. Next was my uncle Eugene. He owned his own transportation company, which, which was his own uh, cab service. And this was pretty big for, for a black man growing up in, uh, at the time. Uh, my uncle George was an educator and administrator in Fairfax uh, Public Schools and Alexandria Public Schools. Uh, he also helped to run a, a store in the basement of our old house called James Delicatessens, uh, a.k.a. Uh, George's Store. I also want to add that I always, always heard stories about R Roberta Flack, who would, uh, who would visit to the, uh, to the store to buy candy before going to Drew's school. <laughs> Next, we have my, my, um, 
my aunt, Mary Morgan, and she was an educator in D.C., Maryland, and Virginia. And uh, my youngest uncle, who is here with me today, Uncle Mark, who was an uh, educator in D.C., retired from D.C. public schools, and also continues to teach here in, uh, in Virginia. Uh, I also want to say, uh, Uncle Mark, that I had the privilege, I went to you, Kramer Middle School, which I always heard about growing up. And I was, as I was walking through the halls, I was telling my, my supervisor, I was like, wow, I'm going to speak today and, uh, and uh, I'm gonna mention my uncle and this is the actual school that he taught in. So I was there visiting the cafeteria and the lunchroom. So I thought that was pretty unique. Um, also one thing about my family and, and Uncle Mark, I'm gonna pick on you a little bit more. It's a good thing. Um, my Uncle Mark had, he, because he was the youngest and closest to a lot of the, the kids growing up, uh, he, he kind of helped, you know, kind of played with us and took us around and taught us a lot of different things. I never forget, and don't get him in trouble, but my uncle taught us how to shift gears in a Volkswagen. <laughs> and and uh, so he would drive, but my brother or my sister and, and, and I, we would take turns shifting the gears as my uncle. Now you shift in the first, all right, pull it back to second. Now you gotta hear the engine, now you hear the engine, listen. But those were things that, you know, as a young kid, you know, we learned how to do. And, uh, you know, it wasn't as many, much traffic and so on. But that was something unique that I had growing up in Arlington. The third oldest. Go ahead. Yeah, the third oldest <coughs> was, uh, was uh, uh, my dad, uh, Cleveland C. James Sr., uh, AKA the good doctor, uh, the head chief, the chairman, and everyone's big daddy. Uh, you see, growing up in Arlington, I had to share my father with the community uh, because he was such a big part in the community. Now, he retired from two jobs, the, uh, the Pentagon, where he worked for years uh, in the printing department and uh, also worked many years at, with uh, Arlington County Public Schools in food service. Now, one of the things he did in food service, he helped uh, uh, many of the immigrants that came here to Arlington in the, in the late 70s and the 80s, the first the uh, uh, Vietnamese uh, boat people that came here, he helped them uh, learn a skill so they could go on and get jobs. And I would, I would remember how um, many of the people were grateful uh, that he was able to, to uh, pass those, those, uh, those skills along to him. But uh, my dad was also uh, a chairman of St. John's Baptist Church uh, uh, Deacon Board for 37 years, and he was known a lot for that. He was a, a deacon for 45 years, and in 2002, he was, uh, he was uh, named Chairman Emeritus, or forever the chairman. So that was one of the things we, we had to grow up sharing my dad. Um, now, as much as my dad was a great man, I gotta talk about a little bit about my mom, because if it wasn't for my mother, again, if it wasn't for my mother, my dad could never have done all these things that, that he did. Um, my mom's name was Mary Louise Goods James, and she was kind of the rock of the family. So she kind of held things together. She dished out the discipline and, you know, threatened us that, you know, if we did get in trouble, she was going to tell my, our father. And meanwhile, she took care of business while he, in his absence. Um, my mom was raised by her grandparents in uh, Foggy Bottom, which was a part of Washington, D.C., and then also Arlington. Now, the reason why she was raised by her grandparents was because in 1929, when she was born, her mother died, and it was of a simple ear infection. But you see, in 1929, penicillin had not been invented yet. And I always remember her telling me stories, and, and as when my kids would get sick, you know, a, a, about penicillin and, you know, and the antibiotic that we have now. So when we get infections, it, it's something we don't even think about. But yet, you know, she didn't even have her mom because she passed away from a simple ear infection. Um, my mom also, uh, when she lived here in Arlington, uh, she grew up <coughs> on a land which is now um, uh, Mount Zion Baptist Church. So she would always point those things out to us as well. Um, the last elder that I want to talk about uh, is my Aunt Pauline. And she was my, um, you talk about families being close and friends and, and everyone kind of knowing each other. Well, my, my Aunt Pauline Hansborough uh, White Yancey, 
she was my 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 uh, she's my aunt and also my godmother and my brother's godmother and was my my mom's best friend through elementary school and junior high school and and high school she was my dad's cousin and they and, and she lived not too far away or actually across the street from my where my dad grew up so she was responsible for putting my parents together and and uh you know hey she wanted uh, you know told mary i've got a, a cousin that you know i think you and him should get together blah 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 so on and so forth and that was kind of the you know a lot of times that that was common for these those things to happen so we were very thankful for her for uh, aunt pauline for, because without her there'd be a lot of less jameses <laughs> in arlington <laughs> um now my parents were married for 54 years and i have a picture of them that i that i was able to to uh, to uh, to bring up, and uh, they had five kids. Uh, my sister Nita, she's an educator. She was uh, uh, she is now the first Black City Council woman in the city of uh, Roanoke, Virginia, which is down south, down 81. Um, my brother Cleveland Jr., we call him Bubby. Uh, he is a administrator, principal at Langston, and he's been here in Arlington for for many years. Uh, I have a sister named Pam. Um, she went to school here at Wakefield High School, and she's now a health healthcare management uh, a management uh, administrator in Florida. Uh, a brother, Eugene, Jimmy, Miss Knight taught taught my brother Jimmy, and, and myself and Patty. Uh, he is a real estate, I'll say, expert in um, uh, down in Atlanta, Georgia, and we keep telling him that you know we need him to come back to to the D.C. area to help stabilize our uh, our uh, real estate. Um, all right, I got to get fly through this. <laughs> okay, so my, the, as you can see, and then last but not least is myself, Kenny James. I was I'm the youngest, and I'm in food service. I took education and my family's love of, of food and combined them, and I'm able to work in that field. Um, as you can see, family is, was very important to to me growing up, and it was kind of the center of uh, of uh, of my life and. Because of segregation, we all lived close together and didn't realize that. As Ms. Walker kind of said, you didn't realize, oh, my grandmama lived right up the street on 17th. My aunt lives on 18th. My uncle lives around the corner in, in, in Falls Church and in, in Alexandria, you know, so on. We didn't really, we didn't realize that, but, uh, but that, was, that was because of segregation. But to me, it was a great thing because I loved having my family, all my cousins, my brother was my best friend, my cousins were my, my second best friends, you know, we, we had all that, and we were a very tight-knit uh, tight knit family. Um, I'm gonna tell you real quick about schools, <clears throat> and one unique thing about schools growing up here, I attended Drew Elementary School uh, for kindergarten and first grade, this is around 68 to 1970, and my mom worked there, my aunt worked there, many of my relative, many of my uh, uh, neighbors, people from my church uh, worked at Drew, at Drew School. Well, around 1971, they integrated the school system for elementary school kids. So <clears throat> now my brother and I, uh, we went to Tuckahoe Elementary School, which is way up on the north side. It was about 45 minute, a 45 minute bus ride for us to get there. After about two weeks of going to going to Tuckahoe, my parents set us down and said, Kenny, Jimmy, do you want to go back to Drew? And we were like, for what? And, uh, and not to say that we loved Drew. It was in our neighborhood. We walked to school and so on. But we were like, Mom, Dad, they have a brand new gym, media center, playground, Log City. Uh, uh, the fields are immaculate. You know, we don't mind riding the, the bus for 45 minutes. You know, I, I later learned, though, in life as, as a grown adult, and when I was, when I was in, in college studying about the, uh, um, the Supreme Court decision that in separate but equal, that it was not equal. <laughs> and I was living proof. I lived through that. I just didn't know that at the time. Uh, I'll take you back about 10 years, 10 years ago uh, when I was still living here in Arlington, maybe about 15 years ago, 10, 15 years ago, 15 years ago, I would fight with the Supreme, uh, with the, uh, the Arlington County School Board to get Drew Elementary School to get it uh, remodeled or rebuilt. And, and one of my 
points I would always make was about Tuckahoe and how nice the school was back in 71, 72 when I went there. 25 years after that, Tuckahoe was being renovated again and Drew hadn't been touched. And now my kids were going to school there. And I was, we were like, no, we can't have that. So we had to, to always fight and stand up uh, uh, for what we believed in. And, uh, and, I, and that was something I learned from growing up in Arlington and, and with my family and, and, and so on. Um, but uh, uh, later on, I went to Williamsburg in Yorktown. And I just want to say, by going to school there, I think that helped expose me to, uh, um, by going to school in North Arlington, that exposed me to other parts of Northern Virginia, Falls Church, McLean, Fairfax, Reston, Vienna, and Great Falls. I, I was able to, you know, I met friends that lived there and so on. And uh, that was one of the great things I loved about Arlington was the diversity and being able, to, you know, being exposed to different things. Um, sports and recreation. <clears throat> when I grew up in Arlington, we didn't have video games, cell phones, Facebook, Twitter, uh, computers, and so on. The house was for sleeping, doing homework, talking to your family, and my favorite, eating. Uh, we as kids, we lived outdoors, and what Arlington was great for that. Uh, we had, we uh, uh, rode our bikes all through the neighborhood. We had bike trails that could take you all the way up to Herndon, the CNO bike trail. So, and down to Alexandria and down to, to Mount Vernon. And, and we weren't afraid to, you know, to get on our bikes, get, get, us, get some water, you know, fill up some, uh, uh, some canteens. We didn't have water bottles and bottled water. We'd fill up the canteens or a milk jug or something, and we were gone, you know, and all day we would take these trips. Also, um, playing sports all over the place at, at uh, Walter Reed, Carver Center, Drew, anywhere, we, any place we could find, Bluemont Park, uh, Lacey Woods, Thomas Jefferson. These were great things that we did uh, playing sports. Also, uh, also, we had three high schools all with swimming pools. And those swimming pools were open year round. And that's something as now as I live outside of Arlington and I've lived in California and all over the place, Arlington is unique because back in the 70s we had these pools which were very great. Well, my time is up. I didn't get to finish it up, but um, a last I, sentence. In closing, I just want to say that growing up in Arlington, it it instilled a lot of pride, uh, a lot of pride, a lot of tr tradition, uh, a lot of family members that were here, and uh, and I'm thankful for it. Thanks a lot for having me. Thank you, Tim. Thank you. I want to mention before I start, Kenny and I are neighbors. And the one thing he might not know is his brother used to have the best parties in the world. And he was older. And I was never allowed to go. go. So I would sit, because Bubby would always tell everybody, hey, I'm having a party. All the neighbors knew the music would be loud. And I would be in my room dancing by myself. And I'd be, please, mom, can I go? No, you're too young. So I just had to put that out there. I don't know if you ever knew that. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I'm Patty Monroe Meek, and um, my father was Thomas Randolph Monroe, and my mother, mother was Eleanor Ames Monroe, and they grew up in Cape Charles, Virginia. It's on the eastern shore of Virginia, and at one point, they were next-door neighbors. Not everyone knows that. <laughs> However, oh, I'm sorry, you can't hear. I thought I had a big mouth, too. Everybody, I used to have a name called the Fillmore Lip here. <laughs> I don't know, it's not caring. Um, at one point, my mother and father were next door neighbors. However, my father was nine years her senior. So as she blossomed into a woman, their relationship changed. He fell in love with her, and in 1955, they married, and they came to Arlington County. They lived in, on a little street called Lowell Street. It's now considered Knock Community. And all of us were born during that time. So they were there for probably six or seven years. Um, I remember my mom telling this one story. It was so roach infested that one day when she was sleeping, a roach crawled into her ear. <laughs> From that point on, all of us had cotton balls in our ears when we went to sleep. <laughs> um, so my brother Charles, um, and I call him Mickey, Charles was five years older than me. My brother Tommy was four years older than me, and I was a baby and probably the most rambunctious. Um, 
so when we finally moved to Fillmore Street, that's another area in Knock community. It's on, let's see, Our Lady Queen of Peace and Army Navy Country Club. It's on that side of Glebe Road. That community was really owned. At one point, the land was owned by Annie Belcher, a black woman, and Lillian Thompson. They owned a lot of that land, and they sold it to a lot of black people, and it became our little community. It was a wonderful community. It was one of those places, if I were doing something wrong, guess what? <laughs> they knew. The neighbors would know. I would get reprimanded by then. And of course, the call would go home to my parents, and I would be rep reprimanded there. The neighborhood was mostly boys, actually, mostly four, five-year-old. They were four to five years older than I was. So I grew up as a tomboy, loved it. If I played football with them, I had to be tackled. If I cried, ah, oh, you can't play with us. We don't want you playing with. You can't handle it. Get out of the kitchen, so to speak. So I grew up that way. Um, I was very, very outgoing at home. But in some ways, I was very, very, I guess, separated from the rest of the community because I was the youngest. And my brothers were more, I guess, homebodies. So I didn't get to go into the heart of Green Valley as much as I would have liked. Um, so I was very, very, like I said, outgoing there. But most of my friends were there in the community. I didn't really have any female friends that I talked to. It was more like a male relationship. We'll play football. We'll play all these active things. And it was great. But I was very imaginative. So a lot of times I would go and I would make believe I was maybe on stage somewhere and I would be singing a song and I would be playing all kinds of imaginary games and writing. Um, however, when I was at Drew, it was a very different experience for me. I was very, very quiet at Drew. I never felt like I fit in. I never felt like there was a commonality. Um, the teachers, however, it was wonderful because they came from the community. So they were vested in each and every one of us. They were, as Kenny said, either in your church, your neighborhood, friends of your parents, that sort of thing. So that was wonderful. When I was at Drew, I made straight A's, but very, very quiet. And then there came, oh, one, I forgot one other little thing. And one day I was a brownie, literally one day. <laughs> My mother said, you might like this. You might like this. So I said, okay. I went there one day. I felt isolated. And I was used to being around people who were older than me. So I was either used to being around boys who were older or adults who were older, and I just didn't feel comfortable. So I came home and I said, Mom, please, I don't want to do it anymore. She said, okay, fine. My mom was very good about kind of identifying who we were and allowing us to be ourselves. When desegregation came about, it came about in waves in Arlington County. At one point, there was massive resistance. And from my understanding, all of the counties in Virginia closed their schools, with the exception of Arlington, to avoid having black students attend schools with white students. So in 1971, that was another wave of integration. My father and some other members of the community, the black community, I think it was Luttrell Parker as well, had a lawsuit. And my mother was also on that lawsuit um, against Arlington County because the black students were actually being bused, we were being bused out of our neighborhoods and none of the white students were being bused into our, in our neighborhoods. And my parents felt that this was unfair, so they took out this lawsuit. However, in 1971, my mother was appointed to the Arlington County School Board. So she had to recuse herself from that lawsuit because in essence, she would have been suing herself. So um, unfortunately, that lawsuit, my father and the other community members lost that lawsuit. So here we were, we were bused off to Tuckahoe. Now, I, if I remember correctly, what my mom did, one of her greatest accomplishments in her mind was when she was on the school board, she felt that busing all the students at one time was a big mistake. You had high school students who had gone to school together, and then to separate them would cause a lot of animosity. So what she did, because she knew that she really wanted to go through with this, she was chairman at the time, she brought that particular issue to the floor on a day when she knew she had enough votes to pass her way of getting it through. And that was to have elementary school, all the elementary school students would be bused. <coughs> I don't recall about the junior high, I think they had a choice too. The high school <coughs> students had a choice to either, black students had a choice to either remain at their home school or their base school or to be bused. My oldest brother Charles, <coughs> who was not considered the coolest kid among the black students, he played cello, which was not considered cool. He was very <laughs> academically inclined. He was an artist. He decided to go to Yorktown 
and that was the best move for him. He was taunted by a lot of black kids when he was at you know, the black schools because he just wasn't cool enough. My brother Tommy, on the other hand, was very different. He was an athlete, he was academically inclined, but he played a woodwind instrument, so he was considered cool. <laughs> so <laughs> he fit in at Wakefield and he stayed there. I, of course, was bused. And I remember my mother, you know, I don't even remember why I was bused. I don't think my mother discussed that with me. I just knew I was switching schools, and that was it. I went to Tuckahoe, loved it. I fit in. It was the first time in my life that I felt that there was commonality because I listened to everything. I listened to rhythm and blues. I listened to rock music. I listened to jazz. And there were other kids who could relate to that. And that was a wonderful experience for me. However, there were some issues that I dealt with being the black kid who's being academically inclined. And by the way, I became so social there that my grades dipped just a little bit. I was having a little bit too much fun. Um, but some of the, I was taunted by a couple of other black kids, basically, who, you know, I got the thing, you think you're a white girl. You know, you, you talk like a white girl. You're an Oreo. You know, I had friends who were white. And for the first time in my life, this raised the question of identity in my mind. And I said, wow, okay, so what's wrong with me? You know, why don't I fit in with other black kids? What's going on here? So it created this insecurity, I guess, to some degree. But off to Williamsburg. Went to Williamsburg. Williamsburg, I felt less of that. However, I became more involved in things like singing and, oh my gosh, what else? I was um, I track and field. And what else did I do when I was at Williamsburg? Um, oh, that's right, drama. See, you remember that. I was involved in drama. I had friends. It was a wonderful experience. And then I went to Yorktown. The same situation. I played powder puff football. I sang in madrigals. And uh, just this wonderful community. I had a boyfriend. He went to Wakefield. But when it was time for me to decide on a college, that question, again, popped up in my mind. Okay, I do have black friends, but what's wrong with me? You know, what's wrong with me? Why is it that I seem to still have more white friends at school than I do black friends? So I made the decision to go to an all-black college. And I went there. And upon getting there, wow, I realized something. There's nothing wrong with me. I clicked with everybody. There were kids there who loved rock. You know, they loved Chicago. They loved Led Zeppelin. They loved, you know, all the same kinds of music that I love. And it was a wonderful experience. And I went to Hampton my first year, and then I transferred to Howard. Howard was a wonderful experience, and I think Kenny can probably tell you the same thing. Um, Howard was wonderful because, again, the teachers were vested in us. They understood as black students, you have to be better than the white kids. You have to be better because you will come up upon someone and that person will see you and if you have one little slip up that person might peg you and so it was wonderful I learned about history at Howard um, I learned about also I became a little militant to be honest with you I remember at that time I said I will never marry outside of my race you know I will marry a black man you know this is I feel good about myself for the first time I know who I am I love my history this is great <laughs> Got out of school, started working, and I was involved with all kinds of things, met all kinds of people from different backgrounds. Well, I ended up dating Hispanic men, black men, white men, Middle Eastern men. It didn't matter to me. And guess who I ended up marrying? Yes, a white man. <laughs> <laughs> and that was interesting because um, his parents, his mother had actually grown up around blacks, but again, you had that strict segregation. You didn't really communicate too much. His father had grown up in West Virginia and really had never been around blacks. So this was a very interesting thing, I think, for him. But God bless my mother-in-law. Oh, the time. God <laughs> bless my mother-in-law. The one thing she told my, my husband was this. She said, when we were dating, she said, very early in our relationship, I don't care if you marry a black woman, white woman, pink woman, purple, polka dots, I will always love my grandchildren. <laughs> She died. As a matter of fact, my daughter is here today, Kayla. Um, <laughs> we absolutely love her. And the, and the one thing I'll say, I'm going to wrap it up because I know that my time is coming to an end as well. Um, the one thing I did, I mean, I think that growing, growing up in Arlington was wonderful because I had diversity. One of my best friends was, was Jewish, so I learned about Jewish holiday, holidays and the Holocaust. And these were things I don't think I would have experienced in other places. And so when I became the parent of biracial children, it prepared me. We talked openly about race. When my daughter was just a little itsy-bitsy thing, I had 
I had chocolate ice cream and I had vanilla ice cream. And so I knew she liked them both, had to know that she liked them both. I had her taste the chocolate. I said, do you like it? She said, oh, mommy, that's so good. I said, that's me. Had her taste the vanilla. Do you like it? Oh, yeah, mommy, that's good. I said, that's daddy. So then I took it and I mixed it up and I had her taste it. I said, do you like it? She said, yeah, I love it. I said, that's you. I said, you are the beautiful combination of everything I am and everything your dad is. And so we were able to kind of get through that. I said, some people will try to tell you if, a, if you have one drop of black blood, you're black. That's not true because to ignore any part of you is to ignore your beautiful, rich diversity. And so here I am. Thank you, Arlington. Right. <laughs> <laughs> now introduce you. And the last person who's speaking this evening is Klein Price. And Klein was not raised in Arlington, although he has a lot of family in Arlington because he is the grandson of Charles Drew. But he recently came back to Arlington to raise his family. And um, you're on. Uh, would you like this or this? Uh, is this easier? Yeah, maybe. Sure. Here you go. Hi, good evening, everyone. Um, first, let me say, this is uh, the first time I've ever spoken publicly, <laughs> so <laughs> you'll forgive me. Um, I'm not as organized as everybody else. I'm a little bit more scattered, uh, scattered brained, so bear with me. And if I look like I'm spacing out, I am. <laughs> <laughs> We're a friendly just, audience. Just trying to remember where I, uh, where I left off. Um, just thinking about um, some things that you had said about uh, wanting to be, uh, having to be better. I just remember something that my grandfather had, uh, had said, and that was um, excellence of performance uh, transcends any physical barriers in, uh, put in place by man. And um, I think that's the way he kind of lived his life. Um, let me just briefly tell you a little bit about me. She's right, I didn't grow up in Arlington. I grew up in the suburbs in Columbia, Maryland, which is not too far away from here. I didn't even really know that I had uh, very many uh, relatives in, in Virginia. Um, and when uh, I told my father and um, my uncle that I was coming to talk about um, family history in Virginia, they got all fired up. Uh, and they started hitting me with all these emails, and so I had tried to sort through all that uh, is here. I, I don't even know where to begin. Um, I, I think that uh, <laughs> this is an opportunity to talk about my family, so I don't want to seem, um, I'm very proud of, of my family roots. And so I don't want to seem um, like I'm putting on airs, uh, but You've asked me to come and talk a little, so uh, I'll just do the best that I can. Um, I'd like to uh, uh, talk a little bit about my uh, granddaddy, Drew, um, Louis Latimer, Nero Hawley, and George Latimer. Um, and, um, and lastly, uh, Gunnell's Chapel, which is on uh, it's Georgetown Pike in Langley, right next to CIA. Um, that's uh, Gunnell's Church going way back. That's a relative of mine as well. So let me just start with who I am. Um, my name is Klein Price. I'm the son of B.B. Drew and Klein Price. Uh, my mom, B.B., she was named after my grandfather's work uh, with blood bank. My grandfather wasn't there uh, for the delivery. He was working at Columbia University doing uh, his research. And so my grandmother, not knowing what to name this first child, when a nurse had suggested, why not BB for blood bank? And so <laughs> that's, that's where that came from. Um, let's see. Um, I, um, I moved back to, to Virginia because I met wonderful woman, maybe you all have heard of her. She's the principal of Campbell Elementary School, Sandy Lockhead. And um, that's one of my greatest uh, achievements. 
<laughs> is impressing her enough. I'm sorry, I impressing her enough to, to tell me that, yes, she would marry me. And then my, uh, one of my other, uh, besides my children, they are also wonderful, but the one thing that's really moved me in my life is, uh, you know, raising a family here, but I also uh, have been a volunteer of the Bethesda Chevy Chase Rescue Squad since uh, 1994, and that's one of my, um, I really enjoy that work. Um, and if you see me speeding around Arlington, then you'll understand where I get some of that from. Um, so, um, let's see. Uh, BB and the Drew family, she's the, uh, uh, see, Charles Drew had um, BB, Charlene Drew Jarvis, who you might know from the District of Columbia, um, and um, Sylvia, uh, Sylvia Drew. Uh, she was pretty instrumental in some of the uh, the 60s. She worked for uh, uh, in law and was uh, instrumental in the um, geez, what's it called the, s the 60s movement where civil rights civil rights movement. Thank right. you very much. See, I told you, scatterbrain. <laughs> um, and um, so uh, then there's my dad, whose family um, it comes from Virginia. Uh, Gunnell's Church, uh, one of the things I like to tell people sometimes is, uh, is that I, not many of my relatives uh, stayed slaves for very long. Uh, they either bought their freedom or, for example, in the, in the, uh, talking about Nero Hawley, he, was, uh, he fought in the Revolutionary War, and because he fought so bravely, uh, they gave him his freedom. Um, let's see. Else am I? When when we first sat down to kind of discuss this, uh, and we joined together, I kind of opened up to the group and said I I really didn't know very much about uh, racism. Um, no one ever called me boy or used the N word, um, and I think that I grew up uh, quite sheltered. Um, both my parents, uh, their parents, Dr. Drew and my father's father taught at Howard University, and so we never really um, ventured out past that Howard University community. And so growing up, um, my parents' friends were all uh, faculty brats as well. And so uh, that was the family that I associated with growing up. And I said I grew up in Columbia, Maryland. We went to, if we went to a beach, we went to a, uh, w which was considered a black beach in, in, on Chesapeake called Highland Beach. It wasn't private, but it was where the black folks went from, from Howard University. I'm sorry. If, if this I thing, I think, is pulling us down. I'm not speaking loudly enough for people. There, that's better. Um, the, um, the pains, the hills, and the prices. Those were my friends. I, I never really ventured outside of that. When my father uh, was a practicing physician in Columbia, Maryland, and uh, when they talked about talked about immigration, I, I, I guess I was shielded from all that. I, I just didn't know what that. W I didn't know what any of that meant. Um, whenever we traveled somewhere, we traveled in our motorhome, and so we didn't have to experience, uh, you know going to a hotel or uh, or having people look at us crossways. I mean, that happened from time to time when you would go to public restaurants, but most people looked at us and trying to figure out what we were. Uh, <laughs> because I, I, I'm not very dark-skinned, uh, and I don't have uh, traditional African-American features. Uh, really, no one in my family does. Um, and so... Uh, maybe stepping out into public, no one could really label us right away. Um, when I went away to high school, uh, I, I wouldn't say I really experienced it, but I, I, more curiosity, people would say, well, you don't, you don't look black, you don't talk black. S so that may have been my experience with it, but I told these, these guys, I said, I never really experienced it, but then my mom was, came to Arlington to give a talk to uh, one of the local high schools. 
And I just showed up because I figured I was going to get free lunch out of it and just go to lunch with mom after she gave her talk. And so I was in the audience and I was listening to her. And again, I, I say this, I preface it by saying I didn't know anything about racism. And I never really experienced it until toward the end of her speech, uh, she was talking about, you know, my grandfather's death and died in the automobile accident in North Carolina. And um, she said that uh, m maybe he would still be alive today if he had had the opportunity to pull over and rest in a hotel. Um, and when she said that, it, it registered with me because, you know, I don't think twice about, as most people today don't think twice about, hopping in a car and drive somewhere, and if you get tired, you pull over and you get a hotel room. And um, growing up, I, you know, young guy looking for what to do, and, and uh, I would have loved to have, have had him as a, as a mentor, um, but I never had that opportunity, and that was made real that day when my mom said, you know, he may have made it to his destination had he been given the opportunity to uh, to take a rest in a hotel. Um, there's a great book that, uh, another thing that we kind of discussed <laughs> uh, was because the old rumor was that he died in an automobile accident because he wasn't given a blood transfusion. Well, there's a great book out that kind of describes <laughs> from the doctor's perspectives, the surviving doctors who were in the car, that uh, he actually was, uh, he was recognized and he was treated well and they did try and transfuse him. But uh, coming from emergency medicine uh, in my training, there's something called the golden hour. And reading the details of some of his injuries, the, by the way, the name of the book is um, One Blood. One Blood. And, um, it details the injuries, and coming from a medic perspective, he had never made it. Even if they had an ambulance or if they had a helicopter flying and medevaced him out, his injuries were just too severe, and no amount of transfusion was going to help him. It was just, you know, his number was up, and that was it. Um, so, um, I had mentioned. Four minutes. <laughs> Sorry, I told you, scatterbrained. <laughs> so uh, I mentioned. Uh, um, I'll just close with uh, Louis Latimer. That's a relative of mine. Um, he worked for Edison. Uh, but even though Edison invented the light bulb, I I'd like to think that Louis Latimer was the one who made it work. You, could, <laughs> you, you can find uh, an, a, uh, an Thomas Edison in an uh, exhibit at the uh, Museum of American History, and there's a little plaque inside that said Louis Latimer and it kind of explains his patent on the light bulb. Um, and so, you know, th there's Go one for the it. black folks. Um, <laughs> George Latimer, this is uh, one thing that I got from my dad is, and my uncle, because I told you they were all fired up about me coming in here to talk. And I'll just end with this. George Latimer was a slave, and uh, he is the father of Louis Latimer. George was a slave of a guy by the name of uh, James B. Gray of Virginia. And we have at my parents' house on the wall the advertisement uh, that uh, Mr. James had put in a, in a local paper saying that he had two escaped slaves or one escaped slave and it's believed that he took off with his girlfriend um, who was missing from another person. So that's hanging on the wall in, uh, in our house. And I just thought that was interesting. Anyway, so George Latimer, back to Virginia, escaped slave. Anyway, I think that's it. That is <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, there's a question or comment here, please. I have a comment. All of you use the word sheltered or cocooned. Mm -hmm. All of you. Yeah, I mean, it, you, you've all said that. Thank uh, you. 
they're younger than I am, but we would not have survived if we had not been cocooned, really. And I had a fun childhood, but it was all in Washington. I took piano lessons there, dance lessons, and the museums, like the streetcars, were always available to everybody. And I lived in these museums, and uh, but outside of that environment, we had to be cocooned. We would not have survived. There's another question or comment here, right here, and then one in the back. Yes. I think you were saying something about um, Lenecco and some girls protesting there. Was that in 61 or was that an earlier? That was I mean earlier. In 60. That was earlier. Or 60. Anyway. I may have read about it later in the 60s, but I learned about it when we were going to this other park, and I never knew why we. I just took it for granted we had fun at that park. But late in later years, when I heard the, read this paper about the girls protesting. That's when I knew and reflected back, oh gee, that's why we went, always went to Suburban Park. Mm -hmm. I knew there had been major demonstrations there in 60. Mm -hmm. but that's when I learned why, I guess. Thank you. In the back. Thank you very much, Dulce. Thanks. Um, it's very wonderful to hear how sheltered you were, because from my perspective, when I came to Washington, to Arlington, in 1953 from Chicago, I was horrified at the, at the segregation and at the measures that were taken to keep blacks from voting, the poll tax, the blank paper registration law, all the attempts to, by the bird machine to keep blacks from having a voice. And the date that I remember that you were born after was January 9, 1956, when I don't know if he's connected to the gray that you mentioned, but there was a bill, the Gray Commission, there was a referendum, statewide referendum, on whether in order to avoid the Supreme Court decision in Brown versus Board of Education, whether Virginia should adopt a pattern, a, a program of um, vouchers. That's why for some people the word vouchers is still <laughs> a no-no. And that was put to a referendum and by a vote of 350,000 to 140,000, the voucher plan was adopted. It was a clear attempt and an expensive attempt and a divisive attempt to keep the schools from being desegregated. It was a very painful period for everyone concerned. You were spared because you were younger and those battles were fought, but I think that it was, a, it was very difficult to watch. You know, I wanted to um, just elaborate a little bit about, <laughs> we all talked about, you know, maybe shell, not, I, I'll just use the word love. Blanketed. Blanketed in the community. <laughs> Um, you know, just just as a parent, you know, there's there's pain and suffering that you don't want your child to experience, and and uh, so I think through um, you know through having strong family, through having you know going to 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 Annapolis to the to the which was the Black Beach Highland 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 Beach there, um, you know, and and going to the Industrial Bank and getting ice cream cone, you know, you're not thinking about the reason why you're going there, um, and so on. It's it's just the you know you, you know black pe black families and black people have always survived and learned how to 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 get along and make do with what you had. You know, um, you know, just I, I'm in the food service business, and I used to tell stories about how you know my ancestors ate ate uh, pig's guts. You know, and and uh, that was because that's what, that was slopping the hog, and that's what was thrown away. And so, you know, those are horrible things. And and you know that, um, you know. So I think you know we look at the way folks had to survive. So, and I just look at it as, as a lot of love, and you know things that were developed to to uh, to overcome things. And Patty, I'm gonna let you add. 
Um, my mother grew up in a town, my mother and father grew up in a little small town, and it was very interesting because when I went there, there was this strong line of segregation. It was funny because it was like white people didn't exist, honestly, until I went downtown. But let me tell you, this was a little town, and all of the people that I can think about who came from this little town, again, it's that community love, people working together, understanding, blacks working together, understanding that you have to be better than the next. Every person I can think of who came from that little community went on to do great things. Advanced education, my, my godfather was a Tuskegee Airman. Um, as a matter of fact, his name was Henry Wise. He was, I think, the first black on staff at Prince George's Community, um, I'm sorry, Prince George's Hospital. Um, so I look at, hmm? yeah. oh, you, oh, I didn't know you knew. <laughs> so you see, I mean, just here, that our community is small. It's very small, and so when you have, even though you had segregation at that point, everyone knew how hard it was, so everyone was vested. You know, your neighbor was vested in your child, and so you worked together, and so that's what my mother loved Cape Charles, but it was very segregated, and I look at the things that all of them accomplished, and it's absolutely amazing, and I think we were talking about this earlier. We were saying that, you know, it's wonderful to have integration. One of the things we're missing, though, in doing that is the community. You know, if you have the integration where you have that e equality, but you also have that strong community base, you can go, you can't go wrong. But I think we're missing that now. And I think that's across the board. A lot of races, doesn't matter if it's just blacks, whites, or whatever, we're missing that. Um, very I, very like briefly, add, I would just like to add something. Yeah. And that is, this is, March is Women's History Month. And I think it would be remiss not to mention a woman who was, a, a beacon of courage in the period of desegregation, and that was Catherine Stone, who was in the House of Delegates, and she was... In Virginia. In Virginia, from Arlington. Mm -hmm. Now, Arlington was very... Arlington was very much ahead of the rest of the state in moving toward desegregation. We really did not uh, resist it. It was something that we welcomed. But Catherine Stone in the House of Delegates, the first woman elected in 20 years and the first woman from Northern Virginia, Catherine Stone stood on the floor of the House and begged the legislature not to have the great referendum. And she was vilified and, would, and members of the legislature would get off the elevator in Richmond, in the state capitol, when they saw Catherine Stone. She served from 1954 to 1966, and she was a heroic figure, and I would like to just mention her to you because many of you Thank probably you. do not know her. Thank you, Vivian. Are there other questions? Yes, there's one here. My question is really to fast forward and reminded too that we, we do think of ourselves here in Arlington as very progressive, but I'm very much aware that there are there are some of the same problems in coming back into society. And most of all, I'm struck by a book, The New Jim Crow by Michelle Alexander, mm -hmm. which really, uh, play, really lays out how the rate at which people of color are incarcerated is in effect creating a permanent underclass. So I have to ask myself as an Arlingtonian, uh, how is it in our county, um, how like how much more likely is a person of color to be stopped by the police, uh, to be searched, uh, to have their rights uh, abused mm -hmm. as, as a citizen, and how aware are we? Thank you for the question. Are are is are you is anyone interested in this in responding? You don't feel as if you have to. Um. <clears throat> I'll try my best to handle it. I, I think that um, growing up uh, as a young man in Arlington, and certainly now, I have a 23-year-old son that lives here in Arlington, Kenny James Jr., and I constantly remind him that as a young black man, you got to have your stuff together. That means, you know, just there are stereotypes that you're going to be looked at. Um, you, he has chosen to, to wear his head and his hair with dreadlocks and you know unfortunately that's gonna that's something that people are going to uh, you might get stereotyped by those things um, 
you know, but as a as a young black male, I, I tell him, you know, your education is first, you know, that that you have to, you know, put yourself in the right company. You know, all of us, you know, we you know, we know people that they haven't done the, the right thing and so on. And you've got to make those choices. Um, you can't get caught up in peer pressure. You've got to do the do the right things, and 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 that is uh, uh, the follow through, and you know, and, and and don't get caught off, you know, don't get don't allow yourself to uh, get caught up in, in negative things. Think positive, and move forward. So that's what I tr I would try to t encourage young men to do, and and to uh, you know, you you have to, you know, you got to have self respect for your for yourself and other people around you, and and. You know, um, and I'll just put it out here. I know this is, you know, predominantly white crowd, but I, I, I work in a, you know, whenever I see a young man with his his pants pulling down, I think we need to have a law: pull your damn pants up. <laughs> it is the worst thing in the world, and 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 I I I I pray that one day we have some type of law because to me it's like I work in food service, you know. You don't want somebody sh with showing their underwear <laughs> and you're getting ready to sit down and eat and so on. So um, self-respect for yourself, for other people around you, you know, do the right things. That would help, I think, the, and, and trying to be the best, get your education and, and knowing that, you know, you there's opportunities out here for you to be successful in life we have to keep on those paths, and I think that would help our young people stay uh, from being incarcerated. Can I make one question? I don't yes, know of the, course. I don't know the rate at which. I don't know this. No. I don't know the rate at which uh, black men are incarcerated. But I, in uh, Arlington. In Arlington. But I hope if they meet a policeman, it will be like the one I met a few weeks ago. I made a U-turn where I wasn't supposed to, and he came behind me and he said, I noticed that you're from out of town. <laughs> 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 so be careful next time. <laughs> I thought, me out of town, but I got by with it, so fine. So I <laughs> I'll say a quick comment. Um, with my children, I mean, racism is still here. That's the bottom line. And so when I talk to my kids, I say, again, you bear the brunt of so many years that, that have come before you. In other words, there's always going to be someone out there who's waiting to point to you and say, ah, see how if she's acting up, if my daughter's acting up, oh, see, that's how black people act. So, I mean, it's just the fact of it. I, I think a lot of us, when we raise our children, uh, you know, black parents, that's what we tell them. You know, I get concerned about my son because interracial dating, that could still be a problem, you know, and if he finds himself in a circumstance, you know, you, you just never know. And so with my children, I'm always telling them you have to be very, very careful. You always have to be the best. Again, you are the role model. You know, people look at you wherever you go, and not just because you're mixed, biracial, or whatever, but you should do the right thing, and you should always live your life in a way that you can be proud and that you don't have to look back. But understand that there are people out there who are willing to make you the scapegoat. So, you know, uh, we're just very frank about it. Thank you very much, and I'd like you to give a hand to these folks. All of you. Patty and Kenny and Maddie and Klein. Good. Thank you for coming. This was spectacular. You know Good. what they, they I have a friend who's from Hawaii. Yes. I mean, she's Hawaiian. Yes. And what they call this is not telling your story. It's called talking your story. I know. Talk stories. Talk stories. Talk stories in Hawaii. Marty, this is